Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to uh, the last, I guess, official lecture before the end of the term. We're going to have another one on Wednesday, which is going to be a special topics lecture. But um, I'd like to continue where we left off. We were talking about uh, distributed storage. And um, if you remember, before we got into that topic, we were talking about the remote procedure call idea. And the idea behind a remote procedure call is really that uh, a client can link with a library that includes a bunch of stubs that allow it to essentially uh, make function calls, which go all the way across the network to a server machine with the return coming back. And they can deal with them just as they would a local function. Okay, and so that's a remote procedure call. We're making a procedure call remotely. And some of the key ideas we talked about were the fact that uh, the arguments to these procedures have to be packaged up uh, by the client stub and they are packaged up in a network uh, independent way and uh, serialized as a set, set of bytes, excuse me, as a set of bytes. And then they're sent uh, across the network where they're unpacked and the server stub will then call a server function uh, with the deserialized versions of those arguments. And then the return call will get serialized again, sent across the network and uh, received and it'll be returned into the client as a return from a function call. And so the client can therefore use this regardless of the fact that it's remote. And um, the couple of things that we talked about were among other things, how these stubs get generated. Uh, there's a special IDL language that you um, use to describe the procedure calls and uh, a compiler that generates the stubs for the client and server side. And uh, you can basically have the server be remote, of course, or local, and the client doesn't have to know the difference other than a um, difference in performance. Okay, now today we're going to actually show you an example of uh, use of RPC, which is pretty common, which is to make a, an actual remote um, file system work. Okay, before I pass on from this, are there any questions? All right. So then the other thing we talked about is we talked about the CAP theorem, the consistency availability partition tolerance theorem, which uh, really was more like a, um, a conjecture by Eric Brewer back in the early 2000s, but uh, it has since been proved in various ways. And the basic idea is that you can have uh, two out of these three, you can't have all three. So you can have consistency availability uh, partition tolerance, you can pick two of any of those three. And um, the thing to keep in mind here is basically consistency means that uh, when you change the file system on one side, everybody sees those changes consistently. Availability means that you always have the ability to access the file system. And partition tolerance says that the network can uh, survive being cut in half. Okay. Ah, so um, before I guess uh, we have a, a late uh, question here about RPC, which is which is fine. The question here is if the client sends pointers as arguments, does the client stub have to load all of that in? So pointers basically don't mean anything cross machine. So um, part of that serialization has to actually be taking uh, any data structures that are consisting of pointers and serializing them uh, into a complete set of bytes to send across. There are sometimes a specialized uh, ways of packaging up opaque pointer references and sending them off to a server, but the server doesn't know what to do with them. They would only be for returning back later to the client. So I think the short answer to the question is, yeah, if you have any structures made out of pointers, they have to be serialized into bytes before they're sent across. Otherwise, they don't mean anything. Okay, so this CAP theorem, uh, by the way, just to finish that uh, thought here, will um, have an impact on pretty much any remote storage that we might have to deal with. Um, and it certainly comes into play when we start talking about cache consistency um, of the, the file system, okay? All right, are there any questions on the CAP theorem? All right, so, um, so let's talk about distributed file systems then. So as you can see, 
the idea here uh, behind this figure is really the idea that the uh, storage is going to be in the network somewhere, or we today we call it the cloud, I guess. And you can use that storage no matter where you are. You could be here at Berkeley uh, on the left coast. You could be uh, in Boston on the right coast or in Beijing, whatever. And you can still use the data. And in some file systems, you can even use the data while you're driving uh, from one coast to the other. And that's all because it's in the middle. But once you start having things remote in the middle here, then you start running into the cap theorem. So um, what is a distributed file system? Well, it's pretty simple. You've all used this uh, many times, but we have a laptop here and a server that's actually got the data. And so instead of the file systems like we've been talking about the last uh, several weeks, uh, which are local, in this case, you're actually sending your uh, request to read and the response is coming back over the network. And the server is actually a separate node somewhere else from the client that's using it. Okay. Um, so a question that we might have here, uh, which is in the chat is, is a solution to make the network resistant to partitions so it doesn't have to be partition tolerant. So the problem with that is pretty much that um, we run up against the end-to-end -end theorem, which really is how much work do you want to put into the middle of the network to make it so that it never partitions. And in practice, uh, you can add a lot of redundancy to the network. You can have many alternate paths that uh, can be taken, uh, but uh, ultimately it gets very hard to prevent there uh, never being a partition in the network. But you know, you can add a lot of redundancy. So if you don't take the path straight from uh, Berkeley to Boston, going straight through, maybe you go by way of Alaska and down, if you have enough alternative paths, you can sometimes make the probability of partitions uh, very low. So what we really want with a distributed file system is this idea of transparent access to files on the remote disk so that the client doesn't have to know that this is re remote from the standpoint of the way you interact with it. The only, no the only way you'd notice is that things are slower, okay? And so one of the things that we uh, have as a concept here is the notion of mounting uh, a remote file system onto the local file system. And so here's an instance where um, we actually have the local root, that's a little slash up here, and uh, slash users, and then slash users slash Jane, we've actually mounted uh, another file system on the, the server called Kubi, um, and uh, the partition Jane is uh, at this point in the mount. And then um, inside that Jane file system, there's another uh, directory called program prog and that we've mounted a, a different partition from kubi to prog okay and so what happens there is that the laptop user says slash users slash jane slash prog slash foo.c in reality because of the way we've mounted this it's really in the uh, slash prog uh, partition on the kubi file system and uh, it's the file foo.c and so by mounting we can essentially get transparency against these, the fact that these are actually remote so the local user doesn't have to know the difference. So that's a form of transparency that we get with the mount system call. Okay, now of course that raises all sorts of questions which uh, we don't have a, a lot of time left in the term to answer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one naming choice which you see pretty clearly here in this figure on the right is that every file in principle is a tuple uh, of a host name and local name in the file system. And uh, we basically everywhere below in the operating system, we always talk about files as a tuple of host name and local name. So this is the simplest thing to do. And it's what we often do, uh, for instance, in the department, et cetera. Uh, it's fine, except that it doesn't give you a lot of opportunity to move files around to load balance or to try to deal with failures. It does let you do DNS remapping. So if Kubi, the file server went down, uh, I could change its IP address to point to a different um, server and then I'd still be up and working. Uh, another alternative though, which is much more interesting uh, in the grand scheme of things might be a global namespace where every file name is somehow unique in the world. And there've been several instances of that over, the, over time. Today, we'll talk a little bit about one which can be uh, based on hashes over the name. Okay, so let's talk about what's involved in making a remote file system work. So we, we've talked a lot over several lectures about how to make local file systems work, but what about remote ones? Okay, so somehow the device driver, 
and I'm going to put that in air quotes here, talking to the disk is got the network involved. So that's a little bit strange already, right? Because we think of device drivers as going uh, from the operating system down into a controller and to the local disk. But instead, we're going from the files, we're going from the system call interface into the network and then over to a different server and then going into the device driver. And so we need some abstractions to let us do that. And so one of the abstractions is one called VFS, okay? So this is, it was originally the virtual file system and uh, then in Linux, it became the virtual file system switch. I'll show you why switch kind of makes more sense maybe. But um, if you take a look at what I've circled here in our kernel, uh, the file systems actually go through a layer uh, of handling files and directories, uh, which is called the VFS right there. And below VFS is potentially many file system types, some of which are over the network, okay? And so some of these file system types might actually then interact with the network subsystem, go out, come back through a different network subsystem on the other side, and then back into the file system and down to the block devices, okay? so. This VFS is going to be an enabling abstraction that's going to allow us to mount file systems, first of all, of many types, and then second of all, including things that are across the network. Okay, so um, what exactly are we talking about here? So if you remember in our layers of IO, we talked about you do a read uh, system call, it takes you into the kernel um, read, which, uh, or into the um, libc version of read, which does a system call, takes us into the system call processing. And then if you look, down here, this is, by the way, a slide from lecture 10 or whatever. If you look inside, we actually have something called VFS read, which gets called uh, from the higher layers and ultimately from the user, VFS being virtual file system, okay? And so inside that call is gonna be interacting with the VFS layer. And this VFS layer, you can kind of think of this way. So you got the, the client process at top comes through the VFS layer, and depending on which part of the uh, directory we happen to go to, remember the, the mounting, we could be going into a ext2 or three file system, um, kind of like BSD, or we could go to MS-DOS fat file system. And either of those could be used in the same way by the client. Okay, so this idea of, you know, uh, opening slash floppy slash test, um, and then writing to slash temp slash test what I'm actually doing in this loop here is I'm reading from an MS-DOS file system, writing to a Unix file system, and this all works because of the abstraction of VFS. Okay, so that's pretty good, right? So how does that work? So the VFS layer is, is like a local file system without any of the disks involved, and it's really just a set of hooks that allow you to plug in functionality uh, that's needed for the client to act with a file system. Okay, and it's uh, compatible with all sorts of local and remote file systems. And it basically allows uh, the same system call interface above, uh, to, regardless of the file system. Now, we won't go into this in great detail, but for instance, you could, you could look up VFS in Linux and it would tell you that this is a, an interface um, with four primary objects. Uh, there's a super block object, an inode object, a uh, directory entry object, and a file object that represent all of these things that we talked about pretty much when we talked about Unix file systems. What's interesting about this though, is what depending on what file system you plug in, it may not even have a, an inode object. Think about the FAT file system, right? There's no inode there. So really um, what happens is this VFS layer gives the underlying connector the ability to fake something that looks like a Unix file system. So you can make, uh, it look like directories are made out of files, even if they're not, you can make it look like they're inodes and super blocks and so on, um, regardless of whether those things are really in the underlying file system. And so that layer, sometimes we call that a shim layer, basically allows you to plug in things that then the VFS layer can make look like file systems. Okay. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, NFS, which is in some sense the first user of VFS back when it was the uh, virtual file system. Um, and so, but this has uh, persisted, you know, to this day. So it's persisted for the last uh, 20 years, 25 years. So 
So let's talk about a simple distributed file system in a little more detail here. So first of all, we talked about RPC. So we're going to be making procedure calls. Uh, so the client, when they need to do a read, what happens is the read goes into the VFS layer. The VFS layer uh, then could just go ahead and make a remote procedure call to the server that then talks to the disk and gives you the blocks back and returns the data. And so we could have a whole bunch of these uh, round trips. And because this is RPC, we could even not care about the, the endianness of the client versus the server because basically the client can call a procedure on the server and it just works. Okay. And so um, this is uh, kind of the first way that people build file systems. Um, you know, you're using the remote procedure calls to translate things, but there's no local caching in the client, just in the server. Um, so the advantage of this is it's the server is providing a consistent view of the file system like it does now if you were running processes on the server. Um, so that's good. The downside here is it's really not performant. Okay, it's expensive to go across the network, even when you're in a local, um, you know, even when you're in the local network where it's going to cost you a millisecond to go round trip and much worse if you happen to have to go uh, to the metropolitan area or globally where you're talking 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, that adds up really quickly for every block read. Okay, and so this is fine from an abstraction, you know, gee, we could build this, throw it together really quickly. This is really not going to work well. Okay, and there are actually uh, ways of mounting a remote server with uh, SSH, for instance, that kind of act like this, okay, where you just open a, a tunnel and you essentially get a mounted file system, it's really not going to perform very well, okay, but you can do it. Um, so obviously the thing to do is caching, right? So that's, we've talked lots about caching. Remember everything in an operating system is a cache. You can quote Kubi on that. If there's nothing else you uh, get out of this class, you can, you can quote me on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to put caches in the system at the client side in addition to the server side. So the server side cache is kind of easy because that's the buffer cache. But we would like to, for instance, use the buffer cache on the client side. And, you know, how does that work? Okay, so the advantage of this is if you can somehow do the open read write close portion locally, because maybe you cache credentials and information about some remote file, this gets really fast, right? So the very first read to um, some file, you reaches out, you get an RPC across the network, pulls it off the, the result off the disk, uh, puts it into the local cache, returns it, gets in the, uh, excuse me, puts it in the server cache, returns, gets into local cache, and returns a result. And so that read was slow the first time, but boy, these subsequent ones, boing, boing, are very fast, right? And they've just returned the value that's in the cache. So that sounds good. Uh, but what are some problems with this, right? So one of them is failure. So consider this idea here. We have a writer on some different client. They write some data in the cache and poof, that machine crashes. And notice what just happened. We just lost data. And that's because the data was cached on the client and uh, never made it to the server. And uh, it's now you know, gone to dev null. So clearly the moment we start putting caches into the system, we've got some data uh, reliability issues we have to worry about. And of course, we could force ourselves to do an RPC with an acknowledgement back first and then uh, return from the client. So the client never gets back an OK until they know the data has been uh, placed on the server. So that seems like a simple fix because now if we crash, we haven't actually lost the data, right? What are some other problems? Well, something else that rears its ugly head, which you probably can see here, uh, you know, this first cache has got uh, the first value in it. The second cache has got the second value. And so if client one reads, they get V1. And if client two reads, they get V2. And we have a serious cache consistency problem, OK? Now, um, the question in, in the chat is, uh, frankly, the obvious one, which is how the heck do you deal with this, right? So this is. Um, uh, so on this slide, this seems like a, a problem, <laughs> right? So this is a problem. Now, uh, we're going to talk about some solutions to this, but you could, you could start imagining some of these. Like whenever you write, you have to first invalidate uh, all the other caches, and then you get write to write. And so when they go to read again, they get the next one back, right? 
Or you could say, well, a little bit of inconsistency is okay as long as I poll to get consistent data back. All right, you could send, yeah, you could have changes. There are many options here. Um, the first, uh, you know, the way they say this is the, uh, the first step is to recognize you've got a problem. Okay, and so um, the other thing, by the way, to keep uh, that I'll point out is if for every write, you're always broadcasting the results, uh, potentially you're using network bandwidth and that may or may not be the right thing to do, okay? So what's good about uh, the questions you all are asking here is you got the right point of view. Um, this is clearly an issue, okay? So let's talk, we'll talk a little bit about what you can do, okay? But um, before we get there, let's talk a little bit more about dealing with failures. So we kind of talked about maybe if you acknowledge all the rights, you can, uh, you know, save your data or whatever, but what if in general the server crashes, okay? So in that instance, this is not a client crashing, this is a server, and you might say, can the client just wait until the server comes back and keep going? Um, in many cases, uh, the client can't wait that long, because who knows how long the server is going to take to reboot. Um, and maybe changes that are in the server's cache, uh, but not on disk, get lost, okay? So when we talked about for instance, the buffer cache holding uncommitted results, there is that window of time where the server might crash and the data isn't there. So clearly we wanna start with good journaling on the server side. So that's something we already know how to do. Um, but we need to, uh, but yes, so we'll probably assume that the server is doing its best uh, to do some sort of journaling, um, raid, whatever you take it, they're gonna do it, okay? but. Um, Something that's a little more subtle here might be, well, what if there's shared state? So think about this for a moment. Client doesn't open, okay? You, by now you're, you're experts in using the open system call. And then um, it does a seek. So it says, well, start me out at byte number 5003, and then it's gonna do a read, okay? Now the issue with that sequence is on the local, sur on the local file system, that just works, right? Because you seek to byte 5003 and their next read starts there. But in the case of a remote file system, if you do that seek across the network and then the server crashes and then comes back up or something, and now you do your read, probably the wrong thing's gonna happen, okay? So this idea of shared state, where in this case, we're sharing the state of our current uh, pointer in the file, between the client and the server, that actually leads itself to some really weird failure modes, okay? A similar problem might be this. What if the client goes ahead and removes the file, but the server crashes before acknowledging, maybe the client doesn't know whether the file was re removed or not, uh, okay? And if that removal was part of a cleanup process or um, who knows, uh, maybe it was part of a temporary build. There could be all sorts of weird things that might happen because that file is actually still around even though the client thought it was deleted. So one thing we can do is to change our thinking a little bit and try to make sure that uh, all of our interactions with the server are stateless. So a stateless protocol is basically one where all the information that we might need to service a request is included with the request, okay? And so you're um, all very familiar with this idea behind HTTP because when you go to a website, uh, typically the uh, state of your access is kept in cookies on the client side and all of those, the important cookies get sent with every request. And so as a result, um, the server doesn't have to hold on to any information, okay? Um, so maybe in the case of a file system, Maybe what we do is instead of actually setting the, um, setting the pointer to where we are by seeking, maybe what we do is we pass under the covers this idea of, uh, well, I'm at 503, please give me some bytes back. Okay, and that would be a stateless protocol. Okay, now um, the question here might be, could, would an alternative be that we could make a bunch of requests and then wait for a bunch of acts? Um, and yes, we could do that. But once again, we're starting to get into that uh, weird uh, general's paradox kind of position. And um, if we can just do everything statelessly, it's much simpler. Uh, we don't have to worry about what the server knows and what they don't. So an even better adjunct to stateless protocol is a dependent operations, which say that 
not only is the protocol stateless, but if I do the same operation multiple times, it's okay um, because it'll just uh, ignore the next couple of times. So that would be the difference between a write that uh, file system that appends, and then I have to be sure I append only once, or uh, a write to a block in the file or block on disk, which I can do as many times as I want, and it'll eventually, you know, the data will get written. And if I, it's already been written and I write it again, it won't change anything. So that's an idempotent operation. Okay. Um, timeouts that happen to expire without a reply and with an idempotent operation, you can just retry. Okay. So the, the idea of stateless is very appealing um, for many reasons like this. Um, and again, HTTP is a good example of a stateless protocol. So the question uh, might be, can we make use of that? And we will, all right? I'll tell you about NFS, which is a stateless protocol by design. Okay, I wanna do a couple of administrivia things before we get there. So our last midterm, um, and again, there's no final in this class, keep that in mind, is this Thursday, five to 7 p.m. All material up to today is included there, um, although we'll be focusing on the last third of class we're assuming you don't necessarily forget everything from the beginning of the class. Um, we're going to assume that cameras and Zoom screen sharing are in place. And, um, you know, there's no excuse to not have this turned on. So um, you can lose points for not having the camera and screen sharing turned on um, when the TAs come talk to you about it. Uh, we might remind you at the beginning, but you, it's really on your, it's on you to make sure that that's all working. Okay. And we're going to once again um, distribute links like we did last time because I think that worked pretty well. Um, there's going to be a review session tomorrow from seven to nine. Um, I didn't look tonight, but um, I know that there is already a Zoom link for this that's been uh, put together, and so it should be published on Piazza. Just watch for that. Um, lecture 26, which is uh, Wednesday, won't be on the exam, but it's going to be a fun lecture of topics. Uh, of your choosing, should you send them to me. Um, and uh, so feel free to send me a couple of queries and I will do what I can to get that in the lecture. Um, barring that, I have some other things I'll talk about. I'll talk a little bit about uh, data capsules, which I'm working on, et cetera, okay? You can let me know just by uh, sending email, okay? Um, that seems simplest right now. Okay. Uh, oh, the other thing is, um, as with last term, HKN is virtual. Uh, I'm gonna, I was gonna post a video on how to make sure you get a chance to comment on the class. Uh, we'll post that up on Piazza, but um, don't forget to do your HKN evaluations. That's always useful. And uh, I think that's all the administrative I had unless anybody else had other questions. Okay. I'm sure you'll all do very well on the midterm. Um, I'm offering you uh, good wishes for that uh, in advance. And I'm gonna miss having our little time here uh, every night in uh, Pacific time. I don't know whatever time it is for you guys. Some of you are uh, in very vastly different time zones, I know. Okay, so Let's talk about the, net, the uh, network file system from Sun Microsystems. Um, this was uh, in the 80s, this particular file system came out and uh, was in pretty, pretty widespread use, uh, still is in wide use. There's three layers for this, which you've already are now aware of. The first two, there's the Unix file system layer, which is the, uh, the system call layer, open, read, write, close, uh, file descriptors, pointing at file descriptions, you're all very aware of that. The VFS layer is this layer I just introduced you to, which distinguishes local from remote files purely by uh, plugging in a table full of uh, function functions that are called as a result of the uh, system calls. And then there's an NS NFS service layer, which is the bottom layer. That's the part that handles the NFS protocol, uh, does the RPC, translates and serializes into a network independent format format. Okay. Um, the NFS protocol uh, has uh, XDR is the serialization protocol for, for that RPC. It was uh, one of the first ones out there. Um, in fact, uh, 
NFS may have been one of the very first ones to have a network independent RPC layer. Um, it uh, has uh, operations for reading and searching the directories, manipulating links, accessing file attributes, et cetera, uh, are all part of that protocol. And that's across the network in the NFS service layer. The other thing that it has, um, it's certainly the first version of NFS version 1.0 and 2.0 uh, had this uh, very visibly shown to the reader or the reader, the user is write through caching, which is modified data is committed to the server's disk before results are returned to the client. Um, that got relaxed a little bit over the years where um, the client might return while this caching is still going through from the buffer cache layer at the client. But um, by and large, it's a, it's a write-through approach where the transactions aren't done until it's committed at the server side. And so this can slow things down quite a bit under um, various circumstances, but you have that advantage of knowing that your data made it. Um, uh, servers are stateless. So the protocol is a stateless protocol as we were discussing. So reads include all the information for all the operations, for instance. So you know when you say you do read at, uh, I number position, not read file name. Okay, and that's so that we have all the information, like for instance, the current position I want to read at is included in the protocol. Okay, and there really is no need to uh, do an open close on the file across the network because uh, the local client has enough information um, and every operation's uh, satisfied on its own. Okay. All of the operations are identified, as I mentioned, so you can perform requests multiple times and it gives you the same effect. So examples are the server crashes between a disk IO and message send, the client just resends it and the server does it again, so that's fine. Um, you read and write file blocks, you just reread or rewrite and there's no other side effects. Um, the interesting one here is what about remove? So if you ask to remove a file from a directory, NFS uh, may do the operation twice if, uh, there wasn't an acknowledgement for some reason. The second time there's just an advisory error that's returned back from the server saying, well, that file wasn't really there. Um, so this is the kind of adaptations to the protocol to keep it stateless and identified. okay? The failure model for NFS is an interesting one as well. It's also transparent to the client system uh, in general. So the idea originally was that when a server fails, the client just freezes until the server comes back up and it just works, okay? And that was called a hard mount. Uh, the problem with that is that servers would go down and then they would have all of these processes that were reading, writing files uh, from an NFS partition. And what would happen is they would all get stuck in the device driver. And if you try to do a PSAUX and see what's going on in the processes, you'd see all these processes that were all blocked with a little D and that was that they were hard blocked in the NFS driver waiting for the server to come back up. And what's worse is that was a, an unkillable state. So you couldn't even kill them off. They were just really jammed up. <laughs> so that's transparent, but you might argue whether or not that's a good thing, okay? And there was actually a different type of NFS mount, which uh, is what everybody pretty much uses today, which is called a soft mount. And if you do, uh, if you do some uh, man on the NFS, clients uh, and so on, or do some Googling on that, you'll see about soft mounts. The idea in a soft mount is that when the server goes down, you actually just get an error that comes back um, and your read or write operation you were trying to do just fails. Now, of course, that failure is kind of weird because the client wasn't expecting it to fail by a server crashing because you're using the same interface you would with the local file system. But at least it's not locked in a way that can't be killed off. So here's a picture of the architecture, as I mentioned. So on the client side, we have the system call interface, uh, which takes you through VFS. And then VFS has a whole bunch of different possible file systems that might be plugged in. How do you know which one to go to? Well, depending on what you mounted, we showed you mount earlier, um, the part of the file system you happen to be in tells you which of these branches, which of these actual file systems you're gonna use. Okay, and if it happens to be a local one, you'll use the local file system. If it happens to be a remote mounted NFS file system, you'll come off of VFS into the client, the NFS client software, which will take you down into the RPC uh, XDR layer, which will go across the network, come back up into the NFS server, uh, 
layer, which uh, comes up into VFS, which then um, or, or uses VFS to access the local file system. Okay, and then the results get reversed in the back, uh, the other direction. Okay, questions. So if you notice at the remote side, with NFS at least, you're actually just using um, a file system on the other side. So um, positive thing about this idea here is that if the server is disconnected from clients, you can go through and evaluate the um, consistency of the file system and so on with all the normal tools because it just is a local file system to the server. And then once it's operating as an NFS uh, server, which you get by starting up the NFS daemons, then um, remote clients are able to access that file system on the server that way. Okay. So that's pretty cool, right? Works pretty well. Um, but let's talk a little bit about consistency of the caches. So the NFS protocol is a weak, consistent protocol by its nature. So the client actually pulls the server periodically to check for changes. Um, and if the data hasn't been checked in the last 30 or 30 seconds, three to 30 seconds, it's settable to some extent, um, then it pulls and asks the server, what's the state of this particular block? And when a file's changed on one client, the server is notified, but that isn't reflected back on other clients that happen to be caching it. It's up to them to, to pull and pull the changes. Okay, so in this scenario, that we had earlier where this second client writes um, and you get an acknowledge back, we can actually acknowledgement, we can actually be in a situation where these two clients are at least in, over the short term are um, inconsistent with each other. But because of the way this polling works, eventually uh, this first client will get the new data. Okay, so that's why we call it a weekly consistent uh, weekly consistent protocol because the client kind of converges to the right contents of the cache. So for instance, is F1 still okay? No, here's a new value. And at that point, the client is good to go with the latest data. So now you, so um, there have been various changes over the years that have made it less likely to notice this inconsistency. Clearly you don't wanna be polling so frequently that you're using up a bunch of network bandwidth. And in fact, the polling uh, is a, a hard limit to even regular simple polling not too frequently is a hard limit on the number of clients that can, can be connected to a server because every poll that comes in from a client is using up bandwidth on the server. Um, and so, you know, NFS clients can only be a limited number of them connected to a given server. But um, if multiple clients write, there is the, there are these windows where things are a little bit out of uh, consistent consistency, inconsistent. Um, and uh, it is interesting, you know, when I first started using NFS many years, years ago, um, I did notice that uh, you, I would edit on one machine and I'd compile on another one. And occasionally I'd save out some changes to a file and I would be so quick at going to compile um, in a window to a different machine that I would occasionally get these really weird phantom errors, which were because sort of part of my .c file I had just saved out uh, was intermixed with old versions of it uh, because of the NFS con consistency. Now this thing about why Google uh, can't handle hundreds of users simultaneously um, is some, is not quite the same issue here because uh, there there's polling that goes on. And so at that point um, you do have to worry about so there's some polling, there's actual pushing of data going on. In that case, if you change too many things and there are too many clients, then you're, you're using up bandwidth going the other direction. The problem with NFS is that even if nobody's changing anything, you're polling all the time and that's using up bandwidth just while you're idle. So at least in the Google case, you're, you're using up bandwidth only when there are actual changes going on. Okay. Now um, let's, but let's explore this weak consistency for a little bit. Um, because what sort of cache coherence might you expect from a system uh, if you didn't know it was weakly consistent? Uh, so suppose uh, we have three clients and client, uh, we start with file contents um, has A in it, let's just say, and client one is reading at the very beginning, by the way, time is uh, 
left to right here. So um, client one starts reading and they're going to get A um, and client two starts reading. Well, they're going to get A for part of the time, but then if client one writes B, at some point, client two might start seeing B. So there might be some intermixing of B or A. And then client two might write C. And you can get this situation where um, transiently, at least, you're seeing parts of each file. OK. And um, so what would you actually want? Well, one thing you might want is what if I want to have the same behavior as I would on a local file system? OK. And if you wanted that, um, so if we have three processes instead of three clients, then you might want to say if a read finishes before a write starts, you always get the old copy. If a read starts after the write finishes, you always get the new copy. And otherwise, you get either copy. And it turns out that this NFS polling protocol doesn't quite give you that semantic. It gives you this a uh, little bit less clean intermixing. OK. All right, now I'm seeing some good. Uh, combinations uh, in the chat here are thinking of different options between polling and pushing. Um, I'm giving you the, I'm going to give you the pushing option in a section second here and we can um, ask some questions after that. Um, so for NFS, rather than this somewhat cleaner um, view that we might expect from a local file system, we really have this other idea where if a read starts more than 30 seconds or pick your polling time interval after a write, you get the new copy, otherwise you could get a partial update. Um, so that's more bandwidth efficient than it might be if we tried to make sure that every update was propagated to every client all the time. But it, uh, it does have that slightly weird semantic, OK? So the pros and cons of NFS is it's simple, relatively so. It's highly portable, so they were one of the first ones to have the RPC with a serialization XDR protocol. Some cons, though, is it's sometimes inconsistent in ways you can see. And it doesn't scale very well to large number of clients, because even in the idle case, everybody's polling. OK? So let me tell you about another uh, file system in this space. So this one came later than NFS, but not too much later. So um, I remember working with the Andrew file system AFS in the uh, late 80s. And um, it became actually uh, the DFS system. IBM bought the file system at one point. It was a commercial product. Um, the, it had a callback mechanism instead of the polling. So the idea is that the, this is no longer stateless, by the way. So we're, we're um, removing the ability to be stateless. But the server keeps track of every uh, machine that has a copy of a file. And whenever there's a change, the server tells everybody with an old copy to invalidate their copy. And uh, as a result, there's no polling bandwidth. OK, there's just invalidation bandwidth. Now, notice the decision that was made here is not to push the changes out to everybody who needs them or who is using them, but rather to invalidate. And there's another interesting option here, which is uh, not option, an interesting semantic, which AFS did, which is basically what I call write through on close. So think about this a second. Andrew file system AFS was really designed to work in a much gl more global environment than NFS. Um, in fact, you could mount file systems uh, that were served in other parts of the country. You could actually mount them and use them locally, and the performance was pretty good. And the reason for that is this write through on close consistency, which meant that when I open a file and I start modifying it, um, none of my changes are propagated to anybody until I actually close the file. Even though I'm doing writes, it's not until I do close. And at that point, my consistent version is now available for viewing by everybody else who's sharing the file. Okay, And at that point also, that's the point at which the notification goes out that um, there's a new version of the file. Now, in order to make this work, uh, there are two things to worry about. Um, one is that um, if I am have a file open and somebody else changes it, um, I don't want it to be pulled out from under me. So um, what happens there is when I open, I actually see the version of the file from the moment I open it, no matter what else anybody else is doing. Okay, So I open the file. 
they can be changing it like crazy, but I will continue to see a snapshot of the file from the point I opened it until I close it and reopen it again. Okay, so the upside of that is a very consistent view. I always have a consistent snapshot of the file at the moment I opened it. And when I write, everybody always sees a consistent view of the written product. So I know there's somebody worrying about race conditions in the chat. We'll get to that in a second. But if you think about that relative to this NFS version, AFS gives you a much better set of semantics because you never see an inconsistent set of bytes in a file. It's always a fully consistent set of bytes. Okay, so that's, that's an extremely positive thing. And um, when we notify others that the file has changed, um, they're either gonna keep working with their consistent version or if they have it closed right now, they'll get notified to throw their copy out and get the new copy and they'll see a completely new consistent version of what I've got. Okay, now, a um, couple of things here. So if you have lots of people writing, they may not actually see each other's rights. So um, out of band, you need a locking scheme or a notification scheme to say, hey, I'm working on the file right now. Why don't you wait for me? Okay, so that's uh, one thing you might worry about. Okay, the second thing that's interesting about the Andrew file system is rather than caching in memory, okay, which is what NFS does in the buffer cache, the Andrew file system actually caches on disk. So the local disk becomes a cache on the file system. So I can store whole files. Um, whenever I open a file, the whole file is allowed to be brought from the server and put in my local disk. And now I can access it as fast as I would if it were local, because it really is local. Okay. So, um, so the potential here is for uh, much better caching because I'm using the local disk to cache. And so you can have many, many, many more clients talking to a given server because the server isn't supporting every read and write. What it's doing is it's helping with consistency management. Okay. All right. Now, um, now there's a couple of, there are many questions here. I think the, the way to handle these questions is just to think through what we've got here, right? So when you open a file, you get a snapshot of the file at the time you opened it and you'll hold on to that snapshot until you close. Okay, and if you, if you want to do the equivalent of seeing whether anything has changed, you can close it and reopen it and you'll find out, okay? And um, if things never change or they, they don't change for a long period of time because they're mostly read-only, then as you use files, they migrate to your local file system and now you got really fast action because now you open, close, read, 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 do a bunch of stuff, close. All of that is done purely locally because the, the uh, file server is responsible for making sure that your locally cached copies of the files um, go away if they're no longer consistent, okay? And if you just wanna read a small, now, good question. What if you only wanna read a small part about it of this file and it's a 20 gigabyte file. Okay, I think that's the question that's being asked and that's a really good one. So the original version of AFS, actually you had to cache the whole file uh, in the local file system. Later versions actually started caching in like 64K chunks or whatever. And so there was a, um, there were modifications that allowed you to have part of a file if the only thing you wanted to do was read a little bit of it. And that took care of this performance problem that you're worried about here. Okay. Now, um, although I don't talk a lot about this, um, okay, I just said that, yeah, I said this, hold on, I'll say my other point in a second. So data is cached on the local disk, um, as well as in memories, um, and on a write followed by a close, you send a copy to the server, which tells all the clients with copies uh, to invalidate their local versions and that they'll need to fetch a new version from the server at that point. Um, if the loser, now if the, uh, if the server crashes, unlike with NFS, we can't even conceive of a client transparent version of the protocol because the server is supposed to have all this callback state to keep track of who's got copies of things. So when the server crashes, it comes back up, it actually has to request uh, information from all of the clients that are connected as to what copies of what files they've got. And so that's a little, that's more expensive for rebooting the server, okay? So the pros uh, relative to NFS, much less server load. Disk is a cache, so then technically the cache is much larger. 
Um, the callbacks means the server doesn't have to be involved if the files read only. Okay, and so you can, if you have mostly or totally read only partitions, you can have a small server basically share a huge set of clients because really all it's doing is helping the clients get copies of the data onto their local cache. Okay, now for both AFS and F NFS, although AFS is less problematic here, the central server becomes a bottleneck. Um, and so the performance of all the writes ultimately uh, go through the server. Um, and so uh, there is a question about availability because the server becomes a single point of failure um, and the servers uh, has to be more powerful than the clients. And so it's typically a higher cost than a simple workstation. Okay. Um, now, uh, a good question is brought up here, which is uh, couldn't the server store um, callback state on the disk? And the answer is yes. Uh, it probably has, in fact, as I recall, it has a cache of what it used to know the server state was, but who knows what happened uh, when it crashed and came back up. So it has to, at minimum, validate what the current state of the, um, of the caches are. All right, good. So um, one thing that's fun about the Andrew file system, which I didn't write down, is the Andrew file system had the notion of global names, okay? And so um, if you were to look at a client machine, you would see that there was a slash AFS slash partition, and then you could mount pretty much anything from anywhere in the world in a way that was independent, uh, was an independent name. And as a result, um, in principle, every file in AFS was uh, globally available if you had the right permissions. Um, and so this is a little different than NFS where things are named by that tuple that I mentioned earlier, which is a particular machine and a local file name. Here in principle, at least, there was global file names, or at least it was starting to go that direction. Um, and so you would mount, you know, we would be um, at MIT and we would mount files that were down at uh, um, CMU and ones that were over at Berkeley and so on. We could mount files that were uh, on servers across the country. And it actually worked pretty well because most of the performance was handled by the local disk. And so this is an example of something where you really were starting to mount things very distantly. Okay. And um, now, of course, you're all used to that with the cloud. But um, this was quite the innovation back when it first came out. All right. But let's move even further away and sort of ask, uh, you know, what's this obsession that we have with files? Uh, what about sharing data instead of files? And one thing that's become very popular over the last decade, and actually I would say last 15 years, is this notion of a key value store uh, where the world is like a big hash table that uh, lets us look up keys and get values back. Okay, and really back in the early 2000s, um, when I started working on peer-to-peer uh, -peer storage systems, key value stores were kind of in their early days. Okay, so really this idea has been around for um, you know, more than 20 years. It's just that it's become very prevalent over the last decade. And it's native um, you know, pretty much in any programming language. You got associated arrays in Perl and dictionaries in Python and maps in Go, and you pick your language, there's a, there's a hash table. The key value store that we're gonna be talking about is kind of like a hash table that spans the globe or spans the network. And so, um, you know, for everything you can imagine using a hash table for in these languages that you're aware of, you can use a key value store for um, more globally, okay? And um, in terms of sharing information, what about a collaborative key value store um, rather than message passing or file sharing? So rather than thinking about taking file system, mounting the file system on two clients and then sharing through files, maybe we have a key value store and we just happen to know what the keys are that we're using and we share that way. That seems like another option here. And maybe we can have more, uh, more options on how to make things consistent and how to make them durable. So we might ask ourselves, could we make it scalable? Can we handle billions or trillions of keys? Can we make it reliable? Uh, even though things are failing and the network's partitioning and so on, uh, can we always get at our data? Now, um, I will tell you up front here, we're not gonna violate the CAP theorem, but what we can do is we can um, 
perhaps we can get to where the cap theorem doesn't bother us quite as much. So we get a, an old value, the key that's, that's pretty close to recent, maybe not the most recent one. And maybe that's okay. Okay, so the basic idea behind a key value store is uh, a very simple interface, okay? There's put and get, okay? Put has a key and a value, and what it does is it inserts uh, that value at that key into the key value store. Whatever that means, you know, it's, it goes off into cyberspace somehow. Get takes the key and returns the value from cyberspace somehow, okay? So the interface, is uh, almost boringly simple. And the question is, can we do something interesting with this that uh, is scalable, fault tolerant, reliable, durable, put your, all of your favorite ibbles in there. Can we make that happen out of this simple interface? And the answer is this becomes much, the answer is yes, this becomes much simpler because the interface is so simple, okay? So why key value store? Okay, I've already said this, but it's easy to scale. Huge volumes of data, petabytes, okay, exabytes, you pick your number. Um, big, right, uniform items. You can distribute easily and roughly across many machines. So if I have 10 machines versus 100 machines versus 1,000 machines, I can just scale up the number of key value um, pairs I can handle and how many clients I can handle just by adding more things to the system. Okay, and so that's, that's kind of appealing. Uh, if you think about a big NFS file server or a big AFS file server or whatever your favorite thing is, um, the way you typically scale something like that up is you go and you buy a huge piece of hardware, okay? And that really big thing is fast because it's got a lot of really fast processors in a single box and it's really expensive. Uh, on the other hand, the way you might scale up a key value store is you just add more and more machines to it and just this incremental scalability gives you more power. And so that's gonna be another um, appeal of this idea, okay? So properties are pretty simple from a consistency standpoint because all we want is, well, we can talk about what types of consistency we might want, but one simple thing is perhaps we just wanna know what the latest value is associated with a key. Um, and there are many cases these days where this is a simpler but more scalable version of a database. Um, and it, you can think of it as a building block uh, for a more capable database if you want better semantics than just uh, um, you know, what's the latest value on something. But um, oftentimes a key associated with a value is enough and you can call that a database, okay? Good examples of this, there are many. So Amazon, um, you know, key might be customer ID, value might be profile. Facebook, Twitter, key might be the user ID, the value might be the user profile. Um, iCloud or iTunes, the key might be a movie or song name, the value might be movies or songs. So there are many examples of keys and values that you use every day without actually thinking about it. And by the way, all of the big cloud companies all have really good key value stores that, um, scale really well and people use all the time. So in this case, um, the good question that's, that's in uh, the chat there is, so are keys kind of the same as global file names in AFS? Yes, roughly speaking, okay? So keys are um, these global names that you could get at anywhere in the system. And if you, had a, if you had a key value system that spanned the globe and everybody was using, then the keys would be a global naming scheme. Now, the thing that's a little tricky about that is keys, uh, if, you, if you just have a key that's say your name, uh, the problem with that type of key is it's very clustered, right? So there are many people that have the first name John. Uh, and so there would be a part of the key value space that's really overused. And then there'd be lots of places where it's underused. And so really what we use with keys when we wanna um, really make this scalable is we start taking names that humans use and we hash them into a uniform set of bits, like 256 bits. That is the global name that these systems typically use and it's a hash over the human readable stuff. So it's close, okay? It's a hash over human readable stuff, okay? But if you wanna take the simple, uh, 
version of that question about are keys the same as uh, global file names, the simple answer is yes. Now, so in real life, like, uh, like I said here, um, Amazon has DynamoDB, which is the key value store that's used to power the shopping cart in uh, amazon.com. There's a simple storage system or S3, which is uh, key value storage that's used for some of the big um, cloud storage services that people use. Google has Bigtable, HBase, Hypertable, several of these distributed scalable data storage systems, which ultimately come out as key value stores. Cassandra is, um, was developed by Facebook, which, but it's a key value store that's used in a lot of cloud uh, processing. There's Memcached, which is an in-memory key value store um, that, uh, for instance, Redis is an example of something like Memcached that then spans uh, multiple sites. Um, eDonkey, eMule, there's lots of peer-to-peer -peer storage systems. Um, before any of these things, uh, we did research in peer-to-peer -peer back in the 2000s. Um, and so Cord, which I'll tell you a little bit about toward the end of the lecture here, um, Tapestry uh, was one that we worked on. Cord was an MIT Berkeley version. Um, there was um, a number of other ones that are out there. So these are all key value systems that partic work particularly well uh, across the globe. So, all right. So the reason I brought this up is I just want you to know that some of the ideas we're gonna talk about in the last 20 minutes here are basically used quite widely today. Now, um, the question here, let's see, does files in key value store have a smaller file size requirement than a AFS? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what the question here is. There's nothing that um, sets the particular size of a value. So your key, is the thing that might be um, limited in being a 256-bit hash of something. The value is oftentimes something that can be anything from a small number of bytes to gigabyte video or whatever. Um, usually the thing that's the limit is the, the, the maximum size, not the minimum size. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Um, OK, so let's look at the basic idea behind key value stores, these are called distributed hash tables oftentimes too. So it's like a hash table, but distributed, right? So main idea is we're gonna simplify the storage interface. So we're gonna get rid of all that open, close, read, write complication that we taught you at the beginning of the term. You know, you forget all that, except for, by the way, the midterm on Thursday. And what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna do put and get, and we're gonna partition it, uh, a set of keys and values across many machines. And so this thing um, here, it, this yellow key value huge table is kind of the abstract space of all keys and values. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna partition it across a set of available machines out there so that um, you know, each machine handles a range of the space. Okay, now I haven't told you how to do that, but the idea is in principle that if you think of the space of all possible keys and values, actually the space of all possible keys is really what we're talking about here. Um, you could easily say, well, here's all the machines that I'm gonna have participate. Let's just distribute the keys over them and uh, make it work somehow, okay? So that's gonna be the simple idea. How do we make that work? Well, there's some challenges, right? So one of them is uh, whatever scheme we come up with to do this mapping from the abstract table to the physical locations, um, we wanna scale to thousands or millions of machines. And so, we need to make that index work somehow, right? That's gonna be a, cha a challenge. And furthermore, as I kind of told you a little bit ago, we want this idea of what's often called incremental scalability, which is we want the ability to add more machines as we need more power. And so whatever scheme we come up with ought to be scalable in a way that uh, just increases automatically or at least easily. Um, the other thing is there needs to be some fault tolerance here. So when machines fail, because machines will fail, uh, we don't want to lose any data. And um, one thing that we haven't talked a lot about with failure, because uh, we haven't had a lot of time this term for this topic, but uh, if you have a machine fails once a year um, on average, and then you put 365 of them together, you're now going to have a machine failure on average every day. Okay, because failures scale uh, inversely with the number of machines. So 
typical warehouses that Google and Facebook and so on have, which have thousands or tens of thousands of machines in them, have failures going on, many failures per day where machines are coming up with some failure mode, or maybe their disks are just plain dying or what have you. But whatever scheme you come up with needs to handle failure very well, <laughs> because failure in this instance is not an uncommon thing, okay, just because of the scale. Um, and then, of course, consistency um, is going to be important. So remember the CAP theorem. So consistency says that basically uh, we have some way that many clients that are writing all get to see, the readers get to see those values in some consistent way, or at least a, an eventually consistent way where we, we all agree on what the latest version is eventually, okay? And that consistency needs to work even though there's failures happening. And you know, bas basically our CAP theorem says that maybe we can't stay available, consistent and, um, and uh, network tolerant, uh, network partition tolerant all the time, but it'd be nice that when the thing that failed came back, we would eventually converge to something. So that's consistency, all right? And um, heterogeneity is one that many times you probably wouldn't think about if I hadn't put it on the slide. But the, the issue here is really that as I add machines over time, these machines are all from different, um, different purchases. You know, they're from different purchases, different lots, um, different, uh, years, different models. And so they're all going to be a little different. And so that means there, there's this huge heter heterogeneous mess of machines and network bandwidth and latency and all of those things. And somehow we would like this system to mostly work well, despite that wide ranging set of components. Okay. So this is a, this is a large set of requirements and, you know, nothing's going to be perfect, but we might want to have some way of building our distributed hash table so that we can handle at least some of these things reasonably well. Okay, and that's going to be our goal. Okay, so some questions are, for instance, if we do put a uh, key comma value, where do we store it? Well, for that's going to be complicated because we got to start by knowing what's available. And if we keep adding machines and machines keep failing, then the where might actually be more complicated than you might think. And then of course, when we go to get, there's a question of the where of where do we get it from? Especially if machines are failing, maybe that key has moved around a bit since I put it in there originally. And so um, whatever scheme we come up with has got to handle where very well. Okay. And then we got to do the above while well, still keeping our scalability and fault tolerance and consistency and all those other things that we talked about earlier. So how do we solve where? Well, one way is we can take the key space and hash it to location, all right? And, and so, you know, basically if we knew these hundred nodes are definitely gonna be used, we could build a, a partitioning that sort of partitions from the, the key itself to one of those hundred places. And, you know, that might do the trick for us as long as everybody knows the, the hash key. Um, but you know, what if you don't know all the nodes that are participating or maybe they come and go or what's worse, I mentioned this earlier, um, maybe if some keys are really popular, then you might have machines in a, in a partitioning that was uh, you know, partitioned equally among the key space, maybe some machines will fill up whereas other ones will be empty, okay? So the, the where we have to be careful about trying to keep load balance in addition to all these other things. Um, and then look up, well, if we, if we build this thing by having a huge table on one machine that knows where everything is, uh, that's gonna be a bottleneck and a single point of failure. So um, I hope you guys can realize that uh, at the face of it, we certainly are not going to do this, which is take this thing that I've shown you here as a big table and put it on some huge database server and use that to look things up, okay? That, we call that the directory approach. And I'm gonna show you abstractly what that means in a moment, but that would clearly not be scalable or fault tolerant, okay? Now, before I go a little further, I wanna pause for a second and see if we have any questions. 
OK, so let's look at a recursive directory architecture or uh, for put. So let's assume for a moment that this directory is a thing. It's on a, a machine um, somewhere. And we'll, we'll fix that uh, in, a, in a few slides. But um, then the way we would do this is if we want to put a new value for key 14, we go to the directory. The directory would say, oh, um, I'm going to assign key 14 to node 3. Um, it would go to node 3 and do the put. We would get an acknowledgment that came back um, potentially. Or, or not, but anyway, what happens here is the put gets redirected through the directory to the storage server. We, we're gonna call this recursive because what happens is the put goes to the directory, which goes to the file server. So it's recursively going from one point to another. Um, the alternative is what we might call iterative, and I'll show you that in a moment, but how does the recursive get look like? Well, we go get to the master directory, it, it knows where to go. It gets the value which comes back and the directory forwards it on to me. And so this again is the get goes to the directory which goes to the node and the node goes back to the directory, goes back to the client. Um, another way to think of recursive uh, structure here is it's like routing. We're kind of routing through the directory here. The alternative is often called iterative. And in the iterative case, which is basically what's happening is we, um, the client says, I'd like to put key 14. The directory says, oh, I'm going to put that on node three. Use node three. And then the client says, oh, OK, um, node three, please put for me. So notice that this is iterative. So the first thing I do is I find the location. That's, and then I go and I do the storage. So I'm iteratively working through a set of locations in the network. OK, um, and then get iteratively, I get back to where the location is, and then I can go to that server and talk to it. Okay. So um, just putting them both on a slide here, we sort of have iterative versus recursive. So the re or recursive versus iterative, I should really change that title. So the recursive case um, is potentially faster because we're routing through the directory server and back. It's a lot easier for consistency because we can make sure we know everybody who's trying to change that given location at any time. Whereas on the iterative side, we've got everybody's kind of doing their own thing and they're talking to the storage servers independently of one another. Um, the downside of recursive is this directory is definitely a performance bottleneck. The downside of the uh, iterative is it's much harder to enforce consistency. So they have pros and cons. So is it easy to make the system bigger? Well, we can add more nodes. Um, and now we, maybe we can handle more requests. So we can serve requests from all the nodes that have a value in parallel. The master, we could try replicating it somehow, um, use it to replicate uh, popular items, OK? Except the master itself is going to be really hard to make scalable. Uh, we could try making many copies of it, uh, but then we got to keep them all consistent with each other. We could try to partition it so different keys are served by different directories. But how do we do this? And so while the, the version that I've shown you so far where the directory is a thing, um, it seems like it's uh, definitely going to be an issue from a performance standpoint. And as is pointed out in the chat here, it's definitely a single point of failure. OK. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a single point of failure for both the recursive and the iterative versions, because the iterative has to start by asking the directory where things are. Okay, Because remember, we're allowing things to move around as failures happen. So, Let's, uh, let's talk about fault tolerance in a couple of ways. So one, we could replicate, for instance, the key on many nodes, OK? So that basically the, um, the copy puts on several places. So now uh, we never lose data if, uh, if a node fails, because we have another copy. If the master directory fails, then we lose availability. But in principle, we could scan through all of our uh, nodes and reconstruct the directory from the actual data. So from a fault tolerance standpoint, this particular scheme I'm showing you here doesn't lose any data, okay? But we still have this directory being uh, certainly an availability uh, single point of failure at minimum, okay? But let's also talk about consistency. So we want to make sure the value is replicated correctly. So how do we know the value has been replicated in every node? And what happens if a node fails? And what happens if a node is slow? Um, so if we want to replicate 12 times, 
and we want to make sure there are 12 cop copies, then all of a sudden the put becomes slow because put has to wait for 12 copies and then it gets back an ACK and then it can go forward. Okay. So in general, if you have a lot of replicas, slow puts uh, are going to be par for the course, but potentially fast gets because I could get from any of the copies. Okay. So let's look at a consistency issue here. So if you do put, um, uh, right now, if you look down here, K14 is stored on node one and node three, and notice that it's V14 is our current version. But now some new client tries to put V14 prime, and another client tries to put V14 double prime. And now if you notice, uh, depending on network ordering, we could get a situation where uh, the writes between the directory and node one and node three get reordered such that node one thinks that V14 prime is the, the most recent and node three thinks, thinks that V14 double prime is the most recent. And really, if these two puts were simultaneous, there's not necessarily any right answer as to what's the most recent, but we wanna make sure that the system has, has picked one, okay? And so the problem here is that get is kind of undefined, okay? So, there's a large variety of consistency models out there of what to do when you have simultaneous writes going on. Um, there's linearizability, which is reads and writes get put to replicas. They appear as if there was a single underlying replica. So that's kind of like transactions. There's an ordering. Um, there's this eventual consistency, which I've been talking about, where they may temporarily be different, but um, some anti-entropy process eventually makes sure that uh, everybody agrees on the most recent copy. And there's many others, okay? And um, that's a different class, but it would be, um, you know, I often talk about this when I teach um, 252, for instance, uh, the architecture class, graduate class, I haven't done that in a few years, but there you start talking about causal consistency and sequential consistency and strong consistency and so on, which is really about what happens when multiple people are writing multiple uh, different key values uh, at the same time. How do you order all that, okay? Um, the simple one I want to talk about today is called quorum consensus, and we're going to improve put and get operation performance in the presence of replication doing the following. So we're going to say that put, uh, we're going to say that there's uh, n replicas, okay, and put's going to wait for acknowledgments from at least w, okay, before it goes forward, and we're going to assume that things are uh, time stamped in some way to make this work. Um, and the timestamp basically is going to let um, replicas that see two things coming in, it can replace uh, an older one with a newer one based on the timestamp. Then um, get is going to wait for at least R replicas to say, here's a value. And as long as W plus R is greater than N, what we know is that if the put happened before the get, then the get will always get the most recent value because the fact that W plus R is greater than N means that any overlap of uh, is gonna basically have at least one uh, replica that's got the most recent copy, okay? So there's at least one node that always has the update. And so this quorum consensus is something that's used pretty commonly now in Cassandra and a lot of these other systems used by Facebook, used by other cloud service providers um, and it's up to the client typically to pick W, R, and N. Um, but a typical value is that there's three, N is three, you write to two of them and you read from two of them. And as a result, you'll make sure that you'll always get the most recent copy. Okay. Now um, I, I'll let this uh, simmer in your brain a little bit while you're thinking through this. But for instance, um, the interesting thing about, for instance, you could uh, ask for uh, three, you could have R equal to three, which really says that I go and I ask for three copies and I wait till I get all three of them before I decide. Or um, I could, for instance, get all three of them and when one comes back or two of them come back, then I go forward. That's really what's going on. So if I say R equal two, I'm really potentially asking for all three and taking the first two that come back. And um, that lets me actually tolerate a slow server. And this W plus R greater than N actually lets me tolerate failures in that group of N. So this quorum consensus has not, uh, not just consistency uh, positives to it, but it also handles failures that have happened uh, while you're writing 
between the writes and the reads and so on. And it uh, handles slow machines as well. So quorum consensus is a remarkably simple idea that has a lot of positive benefits. Okay, and the way you know what the updated copy is, is the timestamp. So what I said here is in red on this very slide. Um, basically, when you write, you're using, typically use a timestamp um, that you put in all the copies that go out there. And basically the um, clients and the servers are sorting by timestamp. Okay, and so responses um, are potentially returning not always the same value, but um, they'll return R of them and then you pick the, uh, the most recent of those are. It's a fairly simple scheme, but it's fairly powerful. Okay. Now, um, and you might use W plus R greater than N plus one for any number of reasons, including, uh, you know, making sure that you're really sure that you've written um, three copies, for instance, et cetera. There, there's a, fault tolerance and performance reasons for possibly having our W plus R greater than N plus one. Um, so here's an example, for instance, um, here's the initial put where we, uh, we want to, um, we try to write to uh, all three of the uh, copies, but really we only get X back from two, which is okay, because W equals two, all right? And so then later when we go to read, we read from two of them, and um, in this case, we read from one, uh, but we we'll always get back uh, the most recent. So, we, so even though we've read from two of them, one hasn't responded, we always get the most recent back because we've got that overlap uh, between the, um, the, the two that we've written and the two that we're reading. We know there's always one overlapping one that will give us our value. Okay, and again, the most recent, not the thing that's most recent is based on that timestamp, okay? This thing, and that's why I've got this in red here. Okay, so see the red, everybody is wondering about most recent. Okay. All right. Now, if you guys will hold on for just a moment, I, I'd like to get a couple of more things done here since this is our last lecture. Um, so storage, uh, the way we get scalability is we wanna use more nodes. We might have a number of requests. We can serve requests from all the nodes that have the value stored in parallel. So that's potentially good. The master can replicate a popular value on more nodes. So we can get more performance with more replicas uh, in a scheme like this. Um, to, to give us the master directory scalability, we could replicate it. We could partition it. So different keys are stored in different masters directories. How do we partition it? Um, if I were you guys, and this is the first time I've heard this lecture, I'd probably think that Professor Kubitowicz hasn't really told me how to make the master work, okay? Because this, uh, I would have this uncomfortable feeling that, yeah, this sounds great, but that master seems like a problem, okay? And so let's see if we can do something. So load balancing, um, the directory keeps track of the storage available at each node, preferentially insert new values on nodes with more storage available, okay? So I can see that might work. When you add a new node, what you'd like to do is you'd like to rebalance everything somehow so that new node really starts taking its fraction of the load. Okay, and so that sounds like there's some rebalancing process that I haven't told you about here. And then when a node fails, we need to make sure that, let's suppose that N was three and we were banking on the fact that we had three copies of things. If one of those three copies fails, we would like to make sure that some other node got a copy so we kept our basic redundancy in there of three. Okay, and so that also, I haven't told you how to do that. So let's, uh, as kind of our last topic before we, we really uh, cut out here is, how, how do we scale up our directory? So the challenge here is the directory has a number of entries equal to the number of key value tuples in the system, which could be billions or trillions, pick your, pick your favorite large number. And so that directory thing is big. And really, we want to distribute it in the same way that we're distributing the actual data. And the solution here is something called consistent hashing, which hopefully um, I think you may have heard of in other classes, but it's going to give us a mechanism to divide the key value pairs amongst a large set of machines, but do so in a fully distributed way without ever going through a single directory machine. Okay, and bear with me, but the idea is it's going to be simple, but it takes a moment to catch. So the idea is we're going to associate each node 
um, a unique ID in a, a ring uh, of all the possible values from zero to two to the M minus one. And typically M is gonna be big. It's gonna be the 256 bits in our hash. We're gonna call that the ring. And then we're gonna um, partition that space of possible keys across N machines. And um, all the key values are gonna be stored in a node with the smallest ID larger than a key. Okay, so let me, rather than um, trying to catch all that, uh, in words, let me show you this in a picture. Okay, so here's an example of the ring. And what I've done here is I've, I've made M six. Okay, so this is a six bit hash space, really not interesting in the grand scheme other than for class. But if you notice, if M is six, then the set of all possible hash values is from zero to 63. Okay, and the idea is, that means this ID space is from zero to 63. Um, and each node is going to have a unique spot in that space. So node eight, um, it, you know, so this node eight, I'm going to put on a spot of the ring, node 15, node 20. How does a node know what its name is? Well, it's going to take uh, things like its IP address and maybe the name of who owns it and all that stuff. It's going to put it together into a hash and it's going to hash it to find where its position on the ring is, just like the keys are hashes uh, over data that we want. Okay, and the way we're going to handle this is for any given number of nodes, which are hopefully spread throughout the ring, then the node is going to handle every key from uh, just bigger than the previous node. So in this example, node eight is going to map, um, or um, node 15 here is going to map everything from nine to 15. Uh, node eight is going to map everything from five to eight, et cetera. And that's going to store those keys, okay? And if a node goes away, then we're going to make sure that the next node up is going to store all the keys, okay? So this is a very simple scheme for consistently partitioning hash values among the ring, okay? So for instance, the uh, key 14 is, uh, is going to be stored on node 15 because uh, node 15 is the, um, the node whose name is the first one clockwise in the ring from the key I'm looking for. Okay. Questions? By the way, um, this thing I'm talking about with consistent hashing um, does not, is not going to be on the exam. We've talked about key value stores, but I want to, um, I, I just wanted you guys to see a real implementation here. Okay. Um, now the, uh, the different types of machines, we have a mixture of these machines. Um, spread throughout, okay? The key thing to make this work, and that's no pun intended, is that these be distributed throughout the ring. And the way we get that is by having a good hashing function. Well, you don't have to be aware of all of the machines involved. So that's the part that's cool about this, which I'll have to continue on Wednesday. You guys may have to come back for this, but the chord algorithm is one which adapts to nodes coming and going where the only thing you know about is a local number of the nodes, okay? So if you look in practice, M is really 256 or more, okay? Now Cord is a distributed lookup service that does this. Um, it, the important aspect of the design space is to couple correctness from efficiency, okay? And it's gonna, um, the correctness, which uh, goes along with the question that was just asked is uh, that every node needs to know about its neighbors on the ring and that's it. So if you go back here, the only thing that node 15 needs to know about is node eight and node 20. And the rest of the algorithm of cord basically uh, takes care of that, okay? And so um, we're gonna talk about that on Wednesday. Um, where we've gone way past our time and court is not in scope for the midterm, so that's fine. But I just wanted to leave you guys with this uh, interesting idea that we're gonna show you how to build a distributed system. We'll do that on, on Wednesday, such that um, we only need local information, which is about a few nodes in the system and a log uh, number of other nodes that are spread across this ring as long as we know only that local information, we can do highly efficient lookup 
um, and deal with failure as nodes come and go and do replication in a way that keeps everything um, safe. And so that's going to be CORD. And we'll talk more about that on Wednesday. So I hope you guys all come to that because um, CORD is one of my favorite simple directory, uh, distributed directory storage systems. And so um, please come. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about some other things. But um, I'm going to bid adieu to everybody. I hope you have a great evening um, and good luck studying for the exam. And please come on Wednesday because we'll finish talking about CORD on Wednesday. Um, and we'll talk about a few other topics if people show up. And um, if I don't see you on Wednesday, um, you've all been great and I'm gonna miss these little lectures. Have a good evening and uh, good luck on the exam.